so for today's podcast, we're going to be looking at the Renaissance and particularly just the characteristics of humanism. So in class, I'm going to be giving you, and I'll post on your track as well, a humanism worksheet um, with the characteristics and sort of questions. And I'll expect by the end of this podcast that you've filled out that, um, that sheet as well as written a brief explanation for why the Renaissance began in Italy. And we'll be talking about a few more factors in class. Um, this should hopefully be on the shorter end of podcasts. I'm sorry, they've been long earlier. Um, so the Renaissance is this period of time. It marks the beginning of our official course. Um, and um, as you can see on this slide here, it's um, labeled as 1300. We're really going to be marking the point as uh, 1450, uh, just because that is the beginning of our course of study uh, in AP Euro. But the Renaissance does isn't just one specific moment in time. It is a progression. And so depending on who you're looking at, where you are in Europe, the Renaissance happens in different places, different times. Um, in terms of the Renaissance, though, uh, and as we'll read when we read about, um, when we read the works of Burke and Burkhardt, the definition of the Renaissance is uh, questioning whether it is a break from the medieval past or really a con continuity of, of the medieval past is one of great importance. And why do we do this periodization? Why do we mark these different moments? Um, well, in terms of what has remained the same, what is uh, continuous? Um, the things that have remained the same from the medieval into the Renaissance are things like the basic institutions, your, your church, your landed class, your um, universities, your monasteries, your chur churches, as I just said. All of your institutions have really remained, will remain the same. Your languages will, will remain the same. National cultures, uh, the practice of using uh, collective action in law, uh, the different legal traditions of medieval past, um, your government structure and government style even, well, not massively changed, and what the primary economic production of the different regions of Europe, all of those things stay really the same, stay very stable during the Renaissance. Um, they're derivative from the medieval age and will be carried out until modern times. Um, in the Renaissance, what happens is the institutions themselves, those things that have, have remained the same, are going to be transformed through new thoughts and feelings about them. So although the institution will stay the same, the mindset, the approach, the goals of that institution may shift. Um, one example would be in the universities, right? What we study, how we study it, what's the purpose of study. The university in medieval times was for a uh, theological base for God, for salvation, in the Renaissance, that attitude will shift more towards how can we improve our here and now. So we'll see greater studies of the sciences and um, more independent thought. Um, so the Renaissance is this rebirth of cultural and intellectual pursuits after the stagnation of the Middle Ages. This period in European history from about the 14th through the 16th century um, features many cultural and artistic changes. Um, the man who coins the term Renaissance, or really calls it the, this new lighting time, this new rebirth, is also considered to be really the father of um, humanism and the father of the, that new mindset that is really grinding the, the Renaissance, who would be Petra. Um, so humanism itself is um, a philosophical movement that emerged during the Renaissance that stretched light, stressed life on Earth and of the quality of being human. Um, but it was... Primarily, it started out as a literary and education movement. It had major in changing the, the literary and education mindsets and sort of approaching it, returning back to the classics in those areas. It will then have a cultural influence. So humanism is really the foundations for our education system today, where you sort of base on uh, classics being well-rounded individual. And that tradition emerges during the Renaissance. Petrarch, who's known as the father of, of humanism, is really the man who starts discussing it in his own writing, was a real public celebrity. He, his father had wanted him to become a lawyer. He was of a middle class background, upper middle class, and his focus was about man and the individuality of man. Petrarch himself was quite arrogant. He was very self-confident as an individual, and he said to his father, no, I don't want to be a lawyer. I can make a living being a writer. Now, writing was never a career. No one made a living as a writer until the Renaissance. It was at the Renaissance that you could, as an individual, 
make enough money off of your own writing that you could be a public celebrity and make money. Uh, so Petrarch started this trend um, and became the first of many different humanist writers who were able to make that their lifelong profession. Along with, uh, in Petrarch's writings, he is going to revive the classics. He's going to go back to those ancient Greek and Roman writings, bring them back, and he'll promote a notion of secularism and the idea of a well-rounded man. And these principles become the foundations of um, what we'll discuss as the six characteristics of humanism, um, which are questioning spirit of individualism, idealism, an awareness of your environment and, your, and themselves, fame and honor, and then finally virtue. So during the Middle Ages, and we'll do this the way we'll go through, we'll go each of the characteristics and compare what it was during the, the Middle Ages compared to during the Renaissance. Um, so the first one, questioning, it can also be termed as uh, self-confidence. I believe on your worksheet it might say that self-confidence. During the Middle Ages, during medieval times, you never questioned. You would not question your lord, you would not question the church or the craftsman um, that you were an apprentice to. You obeyed. It was this notion of ob obedience. If you did question, you'd be punished for heresy, and many times we've seen that punishment before. In the time of the Renaissance, we um, we start to see a promotion of questioning, and a great example of where this questioning really takes application would be during the Reformation itself, right, where the Protestant reform, um, reformers. But we start to see uh, questioning in terms of science, um, exploration, people starting to ask questions of their government, and, and really thinking on their own. Another characteristic of humanism is individualism. In the Middle Ages, you were always part of a group. You were um, you were always part of a group, either through the identity of being a manor, um, in that manor setting, in the town, uh, by participating in your guild. I mean, just think of guilds. You never made an item uh, outside of how you were scripted and told and trained to make it. So everyone's candles were the exact same way, and everyone's uh, stone masonry was treated in the exact, exact same way. You were part of a group and your identity was within that group, um, uh, or even your parish church, right? Your identity was always a matter of belonging. Which feudal class are you part of? Which manor do you belong to? Which town do you have your rights given to you by? Uh, in the Renaissance, the other, on the other hand, there's a concept that man himself can be worthy, can stand apart. So each individual can be on their own. And we see this once again through the Protestant reformers, through artists taking credit for their own work, right, making their own and trying, trying to break away from the typical scheme, uh, writers making their own voice, scientists. Man in each of these cases is standing on their own. Um, people are willing to, to break away from the group and become their one ultimate artist, right? the artist, or the architect, or the scientist. Each of these wants to be an individual achievement. In terms of idealism, um, I think a great way to look at this is through art itself. Um, in medieval art, it was rare to see the human form in any way, shape, or form. Um, you would see, uh, we, we can describe it as Gumby art, right? The bodies are very flat. It's hard to distinguish if someone is a man or a woman, as you can see on the left side here, those um, those carvings. They're sort of carved directly into the wall. Also, if you just take a note of really any religious figures of the re of medieval times, you'll rarely even see a, a sense the presence of a body underneath the clothing. So the cloak and the garments sort of just imply, oh yes, this is a standing item or a standing being, but you never have a sense of the weight, of the depth, of the curve of man underneath. In the case of the Renaissance, we have a much greater um, movement towards uh, that, that since man is in the image of God, we are the most perfect form of, of, of God here on earth. And so we should celebrate that, that, that ideal of, of us being the presence of God here on earth. And so we'll see art becoming much more realistic um, we'll see man in a perfect body or in the image of God in this real form of perfection. Um, as you can see in the David sculpture here by Michelangelo, um, it's, it's a perfect human specimen and also very naked, right? There is no hiding um, that this is a man who's standing before us, right? And it's the idea of celebrating that human body as an example of God. 
Um, in terms of awareness of the environment in themselves, in the medieval times, um, most knowledge was either from the writings of Aristotle, who was never really tested or questioned, so whatever he said had gone. Um, one of his studies, I believe, was even that women had less teeth than men. I mean, that one's so easily proven false, and yet it just was accepted as truth. Um, and so things like that, you have either that was your source of, of explanations or from uh, the Muslim world. A lot of the knowledge from, uh, from, the, from science and math and of the world itself was from the Muslim world and sort of then looked on with a little bit of disdain. So you can see here in this image, this is an image of, um, from the plague, from the time of the Bonic plague, which is really right before the Renaissance or almost right at the same time as the Renaissance. And you can see here that um, people were blaming the cause of the death on demons, you know, the, the, their own spirits, evil spirits down onto these people. So it's just another example of um, of where we can see this this lack of awareness that um, medieval is going to base a, a lot of times turn to the church for all answers. In the Renaissance, and, and instead, we have a lot more advances in sciences, and, and scientists are actually going to start to dissect human bodies and understand how the world um, how the world and how the body works. We'll see the emergence of explorers and, and really delving deeper into navigation and developing new navigation equipment. All these things are ways to um, develop a greater awareness of the environment and themselves. Finally, in terms of um, fame and honor, in the medieval times, your goal was always you did work now so that way you can achieve fame and glory in your afterlife. So when you re reach salvation, that's where you'll become famous. I mean, you, that's where your goals were going to be directed. However, in the Renaissance, uh, particularly as a result of that constant realm of death and dying of the, of the bubonic plague, there's a goal to be famous in the here and now. So you start to see that art, artwork is going to be signed, books will be published with names, as opposed to the art of medieval times that rarely ever had any name to it, which I can't think of an artist of the medieval age. Um, and things like the Gothic cathedrals, they were intricately decorated in areas that could not be seen to the human eye. And why would you do that? Why would you uh, do such fine detail work when no one's going to see it? It's because you're not doing it for the here and now, you're doing it instead for God. And that's going to be moved away. Now, in the Renaissance, you do everything for the present, for whatever present will get you. Um, and so this is a great example of uh, fame and honor, quite shocking one. Um, this is the Pieta, another sculpture of Michelangelo. And um, so in the Pieta, you see Mary cradling um, Jesus after he's just been taken off of the cross. And across her chest, there's a strap. And on this strap is Michelangelo's name. So not only did Michelangelo put his name on his sculpture, he put it directly where your eye would be sort of carried to, right? It's the, the focus of where Mary's eyes are looking to gaze. It creates this V shape. This is where your eye is sort of directed when you look at the sculpture. And that is the spot where Michelangelo puts his name. Forget about the religious sort of maybe how religious this might not be uh, an appropriate spot to put someone's name. I mean, this is Mary and he's writing his name across her chest. I mean, directly in between the two breasts. That is scandalous. And yet, He's not concerned about that. He's concerned about the fame and honor. That is your fame and honor. Uh, finally, uh, for virtue. Virtue is a term, a specific term to the notion of humanism, and it's the it's a term that means to be well-rounded. So it's a quality about being knowledgeable in all different areas. It's a new concept um, within the, within the Renaissance. It's it's really very much related to that idea of being a Renaissance man, right? Being a little bit of an expert in all different areas. Um, a great example of this would be Machiavelli's writings. Um, in The Prince, the man that he describes there, sure, he is a courtier. Sure, he knows how to, um, he's an ideal. He knows how to be polite and well-mannered in social settings. But there's also this notion of being able to serve your own interests without really putting too much effort in and uh, knowing how to work that system that's admired. Whereas in the Middle Ages, you're, your goal was to create, and it was more along the, the notion of uh, Plato, where that, that um, moral man, right, that, that moral ideal who works really very hard, who um, you're really revolving around the church and religious beliefs and being a good moral 
grounding is your whole focus of a good man. In the Middle Ages, the definition would be that moral grounding of the church. Whereas in the Renaissance, the ideal man almost goes beyond that and maybe has the facade of being moral, but that sly, cunning, knowing how to work the system, can play the game of life, can uh, maneuver around everything, everyone else and still succeed, uh, becomes the, the, the aim of the day. And we'll have many writers. We have Machiavelli, who writes The Prince. Also, Castiglione will be writing um, the book of the courtier and really describing how to be a good courtier, how to please everyone that you need and sort of get your own way in doing so. Um, that really sets up virtue as a, prime, uh, a, a key characteristic of humanism and of the Renaissance man. So, Renaissance is this rebirth, revival of art and learning, looks back at the classical arts, the classical learning, classical knowledge from the age of, uh, from the age of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, um, but then makes it their own in their own way. And so, why is it that the Renaissance begins in Italy? Um, and it's important to note that, yes, it begins on the Italian peninsula, but 14th century, Italy did not exist. Instead, it was divided into many different city-states. And these city-states would be feuding. They're feuding states. A great example is between Florence and Siena. You can almost see how Florence surrounds Siena, almost as if it's about to eat Siena. Um, and at times, we would see wars. Uh, Venice was actually a very active um, war, warring country, warring region. Um, and they would go to war against many of the other city-states. Um, and so there's really a few different feuds between the city-states. One is um, the Guelphs versus the Ghibarales. Um The Guelphs, G-U-E-L-F-S, these were groups who preferred, who supported the idea that the Pope can have political power as well as authority in Italy. Um, and they were directly um, put against um, the Ghibarales, G-H-I-B-E-R-L-E-Y-S who supported instead to have more secular powers in charge. Um, within that, there was also two political tendencies, two political trends of the Renaissance. Um, and this is, um, one was being the destruction of the Republic and the remains of Rome. Um, so since ancient Roman times, the rest of Europe sort of was dominated by these Germanic groups that had invaded. Italy never fully adopted feudalism, it never fully adopted um, the manor system. It wasn't as uh, invaded and heavily influenced by the Germanic groups. And as a result, these city states still had characteristics of the Republican Rome. Uh, and so we'll have still councils and maybe a ruling elite and, and some more Republican uh, tendencies. And and so although, although we'll have the Holy Roman Empire technically having influence straight down towards the Papal States, these city-states really assert a lot of their own independence, will go to war against the Holy Roman Empire, and many times will achieve their own independence. So depending on the city-state, you will see some will be um, full republics, others will be oligarchies. But the tradition right now during the Renaissance is actually a movement away from republican uh, government styles and instead having a despot rule. Um, and so the despot would be some wealthy, powerful ruler, oftentimes coming out of the middle class, who someone who gained enough wealth and enough money and power, as well as a private army to destroy, as well as centralize rule for those different city-states. Another tendency is um, smaller city-states were getting destroyed or sort of eaten by the larger states that surround them, particularly in the north. In the northern regions is where we will see the uh, largest um, and strongest of the city-states. Um, they are most powerful and strong because they are consisting of the merchant classes. This is really where you'll see the center of a lot of trade. As you can see in this map on the following page, right, a lot of the trade routes for both Europe and um, the Mediterranean Sea trading complex are going to be coming out of um, Genoa, out of Venice, out of Florence. Um, we're going to have a lot of the trade routes come. Um, and so the merchants are going to develop these oligarchies or these elite power groups that will then rule the, the city-state. The old ruling class is going to be threatened by this new merchant class. And so there's a little bit of a class warfare emerging, uh, a tension between the old and new. 
and what gets resolved is the rise of these despots. Um, they're called the condottieri, um, condottieri, and they are armed despots. They're from the merchant class, but because they were military men, they had originally been appointed to serve the old ruling class, the old aristocracy. And as a result, you have this sort of compromise of sorts in the form of a despot in these republics. So by the end of the 15th century, you end up having emerged really five great states of the Renaissance, um, five great city-states that will carry the Renaissance and the trends. And these are the great trading states of Italy. Um, and so they include Venice, Florence, the Papal States, Milan, and Naples, the Kingdom of Naples. Uh, these city-states don't have any one strong authority. A city-state such as Florence or Genoa or Venice or Milan, there's no king. Um, and the Pope, with the exception, of course, of the Papal States, the Pope has been absent since Avignon, right? Since that, um, that Western Schism, or they've been too busy with the Great Schism to really focus on the Papal States and the surrounding regions. And so the city-states have this freedom of being very independent. On top of that, these cities are now interacting with much more of the world than the rest of Europe was. Um, Italy was the first to be hit with the bubonic plague, but as a result, they'll also be the first to recover from that plague. And so Italy has um, a major influence over high culture and was able to extend it throughout the whole area because they're in this central position, right? As you can see in this map, they really are in this central trading hub. And the merchants are um, going to be so wealthy that they will be able to lend money to popes and to princes. They'll become the very first bankers of Europe, which will then even increase their wealth even more. And that wealth is giving them power. And then these bankers, this bank banking class, the merchant class, will be purchasing material goods and um, not really care as much about the things money can't buy, um, such as salvation or heaven, and instead really talk about how money can buy happiness and sort of create that attitude that we know of today. Just some examples of the far-reaching scope um, and, and power of the, of the city-states of Italy. I wanted to show you a few images from my, um, from my trip to Istanbul, um, some things that sort of surprised me. So right here, this waterway is called the Golden Horn. Um, you might know it from when you studied the seas of Constantinople in a previous class. But when Constantinople fell, um, the Ottomans uh, broke through a, tra a chain that was here. Um, so this is still on the Europe side, as the most spans both Europe and Asia. But what we're looking at, what I want to point out to you what's significant, is this tower right here. This is a famous landmark of Istanbul. It's called the Galata Tower. The Galata Tower was um, built by Genoese merchants. And this entire region here was known as Galata. It was an Italian merchant city-state um, city um, extension of Genoa um, during the time of, of Constantinople and then even into the time of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans will defeat the Genoese uh, city-state here as much as um, they had defeated the Byzantines, but they will actually allow the, the, the Genoese to continue their trade in this region. Um, the Venetians, on the other hand, will actively go to war against the Ottomans and will gradually be defeated. So you can see that on the previous map, how they were interacting. Um, here is another example of just the extent of the, the climb. Um, here is uh, the Black Sea. So this is the mouth of the Bosphorus Strait. And here's the actual Black Sea that was leading out to where you would have, um, you know, Kiev, uh, I'm sorry, not Kiev, um, oh, maybe the gateway to Crimea, sorry, not definitely not Kiev, Kiev. Um, Crimea and, and Russia, you know, the waterways and warm water ports for Russia, the Black Sea. So here we have the Bosphorus Strait. Once again, this is another fortification of the Genoese, so the Genoese fort. They had control at different point, at, right before this point at the time of the Renaissance, of of the entire um, Black Sea. Who can come in and out? Who can enter and exit that that area? So these city states they were greater than just the region that we have been discussing. They are um, they have far reaching, great power and wealth. Um, Italy had ancient remains, ancient ruins as well. And the Italians viewed themselves as heirs to this past. 
Um, after the fall of Constantinople, many scholars from the Byzantine Empire will flee west and end up being in Italy because of these trading connections. Um, so I want to just pause for a moment and really just go into Florence. So Florence is the heart of the Renaissance. We have one city to really point to and saying this is where the Renaissance begins. I would say it's Florence. This is where you really see the first Renaissance artists. Uh, Siena has a lot of the uh, original Gothic art um, and architecture influence, and that, along with Florence, sort of interact well. You can see because of their placement next to each other makes sense. Um, so Florence was a rich city-state from wool industries. And after the Ciompi revolts, if you remember the Ciompi revolts were threat, um, after the Black Plague, there were peasants coming up in uprising and, and as well as urban workers demanding more rights. Um, there was a series, a bit of political instability where the Republic of Florence was not being sustainable, not able to be taken care of. And so Cosimo di Medici was a wealthy merchant. He also was a banker by this point, lending money to people as high as the Pope. He is going to be accepted and welcomed into power as sort of a, a way of solidifying uh, Florence as one city-state. Um, at one point, the French are going to invade, and the Medici are going to lose their position in power. And instead, a priest is going to be put into power, Savonarola. And um, Savonarola is going to directly sort of uh, work against the papacy at this point. And the popes, remember, said that this, these are the Renaissance popes. People are very much into material here and now, wealth and prestige and purchasing art and, and artifacts. And Savonarola is going to attack that worldliness of the popes. And it's called the bonfire of the vanities. Um, and Botticelli is greatly influenced by Savonarola. It's believed that he really listened to his homilies and deeply believed them and practiced his ideas. And so you can see that a lot of Botticelli's art, which was originally about the, um, the ancient myths and, and, and Greek mythology, the birth of Venus being a famous piece of art from Botticelli, he will move away from there and actually return to more religious um, pieces, as well as make his art much more simple. Uh, clear lines, not as intricate, not as, as, as illustrative. And um, that's all as a result of Savonarola and the bonfire of the Vanities. After this, though, it wasn't a very long rule, and Medici will return to power and will remain there until the end of the 18th century. When the French are the ones who enter, that is actually when Machiavelli is, um, at age 29, a part of the government. And so he was a secretary to Florence and a member of the Council of Ten um, under the French rule. And um, he was a diplomat. And when the Medici returned, that's when he's sent to exile. And he writes a series of books, including the French, which you have all read. Um, and he has this dream of Italy becoming and behaving like Rome once was, to be unified again. And he has this national interest, right, this concept of a nation of Italy being um, unified. And uh, so we'll talk more about... Uh, so just to finish up for this podcast, I want to quickly go through some of the important humanist thinkers to be aware of. Um, because of the new framework, you don't need to memorize every single thinker and every single detail of them. What you need to take away from this is how do these writers embody different parts of humanism. And you need to really develop this for yourself, and you should probably choose about five or six of them to be, to know really well, know both the, the writer, what they wrote, and their main ideas, and then for the rest just have a general idea. So you don't need to memorize each one, um, but you should have a strong understanding of many. Okay? So um, just to go through from the very beginning, right, Petrarch. So Petrarch I've talked about already both in class and on this podcast, but um, just to reemphasize, right around 1350, uh, Petrarch is proposing a new form of education where you study the Latin classics to understand how to read, write, and speak effectively, and that's known as the humanities. So Petrarch is considered to be really the father of humanism um, through developing this humanities. Right around the same time, actually, right around the time of Petrarch's death, you're going to have um, actually two writers. I only wrote one here, but um, one is Dante, and he writes the Divine Comedy which is in the vernacular. And it's uh, three long poems, epic poems, um, narrating the descent into hell, the descent, the, the ascent, um, and then finally into heaven. And it's about the journey of, um, of Dante with Virgil. Um, that, co- that, um, 
sorry. The Divine Comedy, uh, writing it in vernacular, really starts to popularize that activity and creating it into a high art. Um, traditionally, you would not write um, high literature in the ordinary language of the people. Instead, it would be of the educated elite, the language being Latin. So the Divine Comedy sort of marks a division away from there. And um, that is actually, he writes it in Florentine, in the language of Tuscany. And that will become the Italian that we know today, Dante's writing in the vernacular, along with another writer, the Boccaccio. And Boccaccio writes the Decameron. And um, the Decameron is telling the story of um, the people who are fleeing the bubonic plague. They're leaving their city, trying to um, watch out for the bubonic plague. And it's helping us, helping, it's important for us because we understand the effects of the plague and how much it affected daily life um, through this book. Um, and also really marks um, how it's Italy was the first to experience the Black Death and the first to recover. Um, the, the, then those are early, really pre-Renaissance writers. Um, with Bruni, we're, more, we're moving our way into the, the Renaissance writers themselves. So these writers are writing really almost before the Black Death and then post-Black Death. Um, Bruni is um, someone who is going to go back and study Cicero. Petrarch studied Cicero, who was a, a Roman scholar, uh, and Bruni is going to study Petrarch, so he's going to also be studying Cicero. Cicero was a Roman scholar at the time of uh, Caesar, um, Caesar rising to power, in and really the end of the Roman Republic. And so Cicero, throughout his writing, really supports, he looks at why did the Roman Republic fall, and he supports a return to the Roman Republic. And this is going to really inspire for Bruni, as well as for many other humanist thinkers, this, this desire for a form of government that, will, will, that allows participation by the people. And this is coined by the term civic humanism. So for Bruni, he links the end of the Roman Republic to a slow decline that um, with that ending, we go into this um, slow decline, which he said he believed that we are now emerging out of. And so he's the first writer, historian, to divide up history into three eras. We have ancient, medieval, and modern. Those are really what we use even today. So he's the one who marks that, and he believed that the age that he was writing in was the marker for the beginning of the modern age. So although he didn't quite identify himself as living in the Renaissance, he didn't use that term, um, he's already a, a feeling like he's in a different time than the medieval past. Ficino uh, is developing a, an informal academy. Outside of a university or a church, he creates another place of study. And um, he and his buddies would get together and they talk about uh, Plato's philosophies and how they can mesh with Christian teachings. And so they talked, they called it the Platonic Academy. And what he helps develop is Neoplatonism. Um, Plato, in his writings, he emphasized the spiritual or the eternal um, as something sort of greater and a, an ideal, a higher form that we can strive for. And that lines up very well with um, Christian teachings. And so the concept of the highest form of beauty for Ficino and other Platonic uh, Neoplatonist thinkers would be that um, it would be that striving for knowledge and the, the all wisdom and the source of all wisdom would be God. So the two would actually be compatible. Uh, so the ancient philosophers can align with Christian teachings. Mirandola wrote an essay called On the Oration of the Dignity of Man. And this oration or this little speech, he says, you know, since we are, humans are God's creation, uh, we are able to bridge the gap between the material and the spiritual worlds. And since we are this bridge between material and spiritual worlds, man can do anything that he puts his mind to. There's no limits to what man can accomplish. Um, humans have a spark of divinity that if they just reflect and they use reason and they think, well, I think that doesn't quite use the use word reason, reason, but we have a spark of divinity that we can access. And there's no limit to that, so it sort of helps highlight the humanist ideas. As for um, Vasari, Vasari was an artist, and he wrote a book on great artists to help illustrate their virtue. So the idea of the self-made man and how well-rounded they are, how talented, how they were able to achieve what they were able to achieve in their artists. The last chapter is about him. So talking about talking about the individual, Vasari is a man who writes this book of all great artists, including himself. 
Um, Alberti in a very similar vein. Alberti was um, a very prolific writer. He wrote novels, plays, legal treatises. He wrote a study on family life and family structure. He also was an architect. He designed churches, palaces, forts, and he also developed um, encryption codes, you know, secret ways to break, you know, for codes to send different languages in secret. Uh, then after all of that writing, at the end of his life, he wrote an autobiography in the third person. So he wrote, you know, in, uh, he did this, and he accomplished that, and Alberti was able to do this, um, just to sort of help illustrate some of these humanist ideas, reflecting once again on them. Uh, Christine de Pizan was one of a few women who were educated, who were writers at this time. Um, Christine de Pizan, what makes her really unique is that she... Uh, was able to write for a living. She was able to, serve, uh, to support herself. After her husband's death, she really had to fight to keep her property, and so she's going to be able to write, and she wrote a book called the City of Ladies. And in the City of Ladies, she imagines a, a city that was um, fully, uh, that, that used all women. And so in the book, she advocates for educating women because they would be capable and able to manage an entire city and how it would run considered to be one of the first um, writings of a feminist, a feminist writer uh, in history. Um, Castiglione is writing a book called The Book of the Courtier, and in this book he describes the ideal courtier for a man of the court, or the ideal Renaissance man, and it became um, widely read and um, published um, so as a guidebook on how to behave, uh, you might have, um, today there's the, the book on how to dress preppy. And so like that code book of, of prep dress and press prep, um, prep behavior. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but, um, and so was Castiglione's, uh, courtier book, but, um, but he's describing, you know, uh, a man has to be, uh, trained and disciplined, fashionable, uh, well-rounded, spiritual, physical, um, intellectual, uh, they sh a man should be able to compose a sonnet while wrestling, singing, uh, riding on horse, being able to solve a complex math problem, and most importantly, to be able to speak and write eloquently. Um, Castiglione really describes the concept of civic humanism in his in his book as well, saying you know you need to be able to participate in society actively to be a true man. Within the book, he also um, describes how women should be educated. And he does advocate for education of women in the line of being able to read poetry and write poetry, to have music literacy, and also to be able to um, be affable, to be able to be easy to talk to and have knowledge enough to have a conversation. 